Welcome to Bible Study Hub. It is good to have you here with us tonight. We've got the exciting privilege of starting in on Luke chapter 10 today. Yeah, We're really blowing and going. I, I'm proud know. of us. I know, I am too. By the way, I'm Anne. This oh. is my daughter, Noelle. Nice she lives you. in Seattle, but she's in Pennsylvania quarantining with us during this COVID-19 saga. <laughs> I don't even know what you call it anymore. It just keeps going and going and going. It's okay. Don't, don't That's read the news. That's all right because it means we can keep doing this every yes. night. So. And we're in chapter 10. Yes. Just a note that we will be taking off Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week so that you can celebrate Good Friday and Easter with your families. And then we will be right back on it on Monday. That's right. So we have an announcement in the group. Um, we just want to keep telling you so nobody tunes in and then feels sad because... So that we're not getting messages like, where are you? Is everybody still alive? <laughs> Do you have the virus? No. We haven't left the house. <laughs> that is weeks. So true. But, well. Well, let's right, get then. in. Let's do it. So let me pray us in and then um, have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 10 because we're going to dive in. There. No, that was good. Jesus, thank you so much for another night together with our dear friends across the the internet, and I think of every single one of these people watching both live and on video, Lord, you are looking down right now. You know exactly who they are. You know mm -hmm. them inside and out. You know every hair on their head. And Jesus, would you take your word tonight and just enrich their understanding of you. Help us to know you better at the end of this hour than we did going into it. We love you and adore you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, Luke chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 1. That seems reasonable and logical. It sure does. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go? Sure. We are in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. It says this, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Why would Jesus do something like this, Mama? Well, he's got his apostles, the 12, but... I feel like this is one last major blitz, let's call it. He's got about six months now before he's crucified. And you can Not see the long. intensity building as he attempts to give every single person in the vicinity an opportunity to hear about him, hear from him, and come to know him so that they will come to know Jesus as their Messiah. So he actually has these 70 people who we know, he didn't just pick out of nowhere. These are people who have been yeah. with him, following him, listening to him, watching him, experiencing, I'm sure, some of them themselves, some of the healing miracles or have had demons cast out. And they are true followers of him. So he gets them together and he says, I'm gonna send you guys out to the towns I'm about to go to. I'm gonna send you in groups of two. There's a lot of accountability. And there's also that passage in Deuteronomy that we keep mentioning that every matter must be confirmed in the mouths of two or three witnesses. So as um, they come back and share, to have two people kind of fulfills that commandment in the yeah. law. So that's all that's going on there. It's fantastic. We'll keep going in verse 2. Okay. He told them this. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. Okay, wow. All right. We just got started, and it's already <laughs> It's good. It's, it's getting good. intense already, my friend. All right, so I don't know if you were brought up in, we'll call it church world or not, but I was. And this passage was always explained that that as Jesus looked out, you know, he could see the plight of the harvest, and these are the people who want to come to know him, but they just don't have enough information, basically. And you go out and you get those people and you bring them in by telling them the good news of the gospel. You harvest. Yeah, that's a harvest. And and honestly, I think there is some truth to that because we know that that there are people out there that are exactly like what I just explained. They they would love to know Jesus. They just don't have the information because no one has brought it to them or they haven't found it yet. So we are absolutely instructed to go out and preach to people. And you don't ever know who's ready and who's not. But you, you preach anyway and you share the gospel anyway. And then those who are prepared and ready and have soft hearts, God will then draw to himself and they will respond. There's just one thing. And that is, as I was studying this, there are 
quite a few passages in the Word of God that use the word harvest, same word, to talk about judgment. And I, and I sat back and I thought, I honestly, I'm, I didn't even tell Noel this, but I had this moment with the Lord where I said, Lord, I don't want to, I just don't want to go there. Can I please just not talk about that part? Can I just please just move on? Because nobody will ask. <laughs> and then I thought, no, I can't. <laughs> I, I have to, I have to bring it up. So here's the thing. And you don't have to turn there, but there's a passage in Matthew chapter 9. You can look later if you want to. Matthew 9, 36 and 37. Matthew 9. 36 and 37, for those of you who are always writing down. Matthew 9, 36 and okay, 37. Okay, we get it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> they where, already wrote it down. All right, no, they didn't. They're still working on it. They're grabbing paper. I know how that goes. Um, it says, when, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We just kind of had that whole sheep and wolves thing. So Jesus is using metaphors in more than one location that are very similar. Then he said to his disciples, verse 37 of Matthew 9, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Sounds like what he said in Luke. It's a different time, by the way, different place, but he's saying the same thing. And then he says, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And what I found was in Matthew 13, 30, harvest is talked about in a story with both believers and unbelievers. It's a parable about wheat and chaff. And it says at the end, the Lord will harvest them and, and the wheat he will put into his barn. Those are the believers that go to heaven. And then the chaff he burns, the unbelievers in hell. And so that's obviously harvest is a judgment. And then, I mean, Revelation 14, 14 to 20, Revelation 14, 14 to 20, whoa, really talks about, I mean, the metaphor is unmistakably clear. It's a sickle. It's harvesting like over and over, and it is absolutely judgment. So, so here's what I think, back to our passage in Luke, we can say. Like I said, there's definitely people out there that are, they're, they're willing, they're ready, they're, if they just knew, you know, they would, they would come to Jesus and we need to be sharing the gospel especially for those people. But I think when Jesus looks up, especially in Matthew, when it says he saw the crowds and he had compassion, that word compassion is that the, the strongest word in the Greek language for feeling in the gut. Like it literally... It's almost nauseous. Yes. Have you ever had that where you maybe you're reading about something and it makes your stomach turn? Like literally it makes you feel sick because you're you're having compassion for the people that you're reading about something awful that's going on. So intense. On. That's the word Visceral. that is used in that passage. And and also when it talks about the um the sheep without a shepherd and it says they were harassed and helpless. Mm -hmm. And I looked up those words in the interlinear Bible, my best friend, because it will give you the Greek and then it will tell you all the meanings for that Greek word starting with the most common to the least common, just like you would in an English dictionary. Interlinear Bible, you'll love it. Um, so I looked up those two words and um, harassed and helpless actually means like, like the harassed part is like exhausted or even an animal skinned. Okay, so this is the picture. It's not just harassed like we think like heckling or something. That's not it. They are, these people, this crowd is exhausted. It's almost like an animal that's been skinned, just brutally treated. And then helpless doesn't just mean like, oh, I can't do anything. It means thrown down, lying prostate, prostrate, sorry, totally helpless. And what this is saying is that the religious leaders of this time have so devoured these people. He's looking over the massive crowd and he's, he's like, oh, they're like animals that have been skinned that are lying there helpless because the religious leaders have given them nothing but rule after rule after regulation after regulation. These people are trying to earn their salvation. They're trying to be good enough to get into God's good graces. And he says, go out into those fields because the harvest is near. And I think in that context, we can easily see that harvest would be pertaining to there will come a point where they are judged and get out there 
and help these people because the religious leaders aren't getting it done. So all that to say, I think there are two meanings here. Probably it's judgment, to be perfectly honest with you, but I think we also need to keep in mind that we just need to be giving the gospel to people because you don't know who's ready and who's not. Give it to them. Let God take care of that. Absolutely. And then in verse 3, it says, Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Mm. And like you said, we've talked about this a little bit before, but I mean, whenever you have the image of sheep, I mean, the sheep, they're really dumb. They're really stupid. They can't really take care of themselves. And they're super, I mean, they have no ability to defend themselves. They're all soft. They don't really have a hard bite. They don't have any claws. Think of a sheep, big, they're puppy little, body, teeny tiny skinny legs. They're like clouds walking around on pencils. How do you run on that? You exactly. <laughs> they can't run. They can't outrun. And these are people who understood sheep, by the way, and yes. cute, Janice is, and absolutely They're cute. They're very cute. Yeah, yes. they, they can't take care of themselves. No, no, no. And you brought up something I saw, I just thought was so interesting, is that she was reading from a, a modern day shepherd, a, mm-hmm. somebody from the past, you know, 100 years, talking about how once in a while, even the best shepherds will lose a sheep to a wolf, and it'll eat them. And what this guy said actually freaked me out. He said, even in all these years, I have never seen a wolf. They're so sneaky. They're so nefarious. They get in there and they take that sheep out. What Jesus just said was, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. It's actually the opposite. Like you got this whole pack of wolves and you're like, I'm going to just plop a lamb in here. See how that's going to go. Uh, wow. It's kind of a daunting thing. And they, by so the way, scary. we talk about it. They, he didn't need to explain this to them. No, they, they knew exactly what he was saying. Automatically got it. Like, oh my goodness. And that's what I noticed. Thing is that none of them apparently said, oh, (laughs) then I think I'm not going to (laughs) go. How about you pick somebody else to fill in my place? Because that sounds a lot like death to me, and I just don't really think I want to do that. And what we were talking about is we don't really know beyond this chapter anything about these 70-ish people. We we just don't know what happened to them. But we assume eventually they probably went to their death for Christ, because he said he would send them into the wolves. Mm. He's worth dying for. Yeah, and but the other thing I love is that Jesus never sugarcoats what's going to happen. Yes, He's not you. like, don't worry, it'll be fine, everything's good, no problems. He's like, no, FYI, what I'm going to do is send you out like lambs and plop you into the wolves that want to eat you. Mm. That's how that's going to go. And on top of that, don't take a purse or bag or sample, sandals. Don't take anything with you to feasibly protect yourself or have something to trade with. Don't take anything. But again, this tells us a lot about who Jesus was and why he's very different than the other kind of gurus and messiahs and that you see throughout history who are there to gain power and wealth. Money. Always false. It's always about money. I'll tell you what, you can identify a false religious teacher very quickly by their propensity to garner lots and lots of money. Like that's their focus. Yeah, you know, when, they, they when the break goal it in from the people. When the goal is a, a private jet. Yeah. Probably a good indication. And Jesus is saying, don't take don't even take a purse so you can collect money. I don't want you doing that. I don't want you worried about that. So he says, Don't do any of that. I'm curious though, mm-hmm. after that he says, Do not greet anyone on the road. Mm. Weird thing to say. Why do you say that? I, I think what he's saying, again, you have to think about the culture of the time. Very, very, very communal. So where we, as task-driven people, will see a friend on the road and literally not stop. Hey, hey, what's going on? Okay, bye. And that's how we do it. That's not how they would have done it. <laughs> that would have been very rude. They would have stopped and had community with the person. And it was all about community and, and hanging together in a community. That's why the synagogue was so important and why it was so awful if you got kicked out of the synagogue. You yeah. no more community. So all he's saying is, Stay on task. <laughs> I, I don't want you collecting money. I don't want you moving from house to house either. We'll get to that in a moment. Yes, because you might be trying to get, like, work your way up to a better house and all of those things. So I don't want you yeah. stopping on the road and having a big powwow with people that you're seeing. Stay on task. Stay focused. We got places to be. Let's get there. Let's do it. I love it. Um, he says in verse 5, and you just referenced this a little bit. This is Mark, t- uh, sorry, Luke 10, if you're just trying. Mark, where are we? I need to go to bed. Dad's already in bed. He usually watches us, but he's in bed. All right, go ahead. We're all in 
probably mentally in bed right now. <laughs> I hope you're not in bed right now. Like, you can be. Just don't be asleep. Okay, go ahead. I assure you, you will not be able to sleep through this. <laughs> Luke 10, verse 5. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house, what you were just saying. Don't get to a town and be like, okay, I'll spend a week with you. I've now made friends at a nicer house. I will go over there. Oh, that house has somebody who makes homemade sourdough bread from their own sourdough starter. I will go there, mm -hmm. which is what I did. Mm -hmm. um, so you pick the house. I love this concept that when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. Yeah, it's so cool. And that doesn't mean that you would walk in the door and literally say, Peace to this house. Peace to this house. That's what I do when I walk in. Yeah. Peace well, I mean, it sounds nice, but what on earth does that mean? <laughs> right. I, I mean, seriously, <laughs> peace to you. Okay, thank you. Thank I mean, it sounds you. better than like other things you could say. <laughs> but, but that's not what this means. The, the peace that God brings is only available through the gospel. Right. Right? So, Salvation. So if you walk into a house and you offer that house peace, what are you offering? You're offering the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ alone, not through your good works because there's no peace in that. Believe me, that is a train wreck when you're trying to earn it because you can't. Uh, but, it, but it's that peace. And then when it says um, man of peace, some of you may have a better translation. Yes. What's a better translation of that? Son. Of peace. That's what it really ought to say. Okay, I've, I've harped on this point enough, so I'm going to pose it back oh, to you. Oh, good. Why would it be interesting? What does son of peace mean? For those of you who've been following along with us insanely well every <laughs> night. <laughs> what does son of peace mean? Who would this person be? What would they be like? What would they believe? Looking forward to reading Who is a son of peace? And if you're watching on YouTube and you're wondering, who are you talking to? This is a Facebook Live, and we can see comments as they're coming up, which is why we're interacting. You will not see it on YouTube, but you do see it on Facebook. 9 p.m. hang with us. Bible Study Hub during the coronavirus every night. <laughs> Nobody's commenting so far, unless they are on yours. Oh, I don't even have mine up. I can make that happen. Okay, Jana says, internal peace with Jesus. All right, Jana, thank Great. you. Good. Krista says, son of peace equals Jesus. Ha <laughs> ha, Renee. Ah, he emulates the Father. God is peace. Zuka says, Beautiful. Jesus. Lisa says, Jesus. Krista, peace is a person. Jesus. Susie's there too with Jesus. Yeah, absolutely stellar. Because one of the things that we've talked about quite a bit is that in this time, the son is always going to be the very essence of his father. So whatever the Father is, the very essence of that is the Son. And so when we say Son of Peace, that means the very essence of this man would be peace. And what you guys so beautifully said, peace is Jesus. And so this would be somebody who accepts that message of peace, accepts that message of salvation, and is then a Son of Peace. Exactly. It's really nice. And if that person does not accept that, it sort of bounces right back onto mm. the other guy. It's like, all right, keep moving. Have you ever... Try to share the peace of Jesus with somebody. You, you've, you've tried to share the gospel, and it like, bam, it bounces right yeah. off the person and right back in your face. It's I mean, like, yeah, it's like a little brick wall in front of you. Yeah, it, it, that's exactly. I, I just love how Jesus just makes everything so relevant. Yeah. I mean, even now, like, it literally feels like your words have hit the person, bounced back, and smacked you in the face. Mm -hmm. At times, that's obviously not what you hope for, but it happens sometimes. And then it says, if if that happens, that you are to then, th this is again, the 70, not us. He's talking specifically to the 70. But who are at for a very specific mission and purpose. Exactly. To go, basically go into the center of town and shake the dust, wipe the dust off your feet. What was the significance of that? And I'm going to pose that back to you because we've also covered this in another chapter in Luke would love, and I'm reading some of your comments, we're not reading them all out loud, but um, many of you are saying yes, unfortunately. and That's something you've experienced. Yes, 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 I have with an atheist. And that's that's hard and it's sad. We, we just pray that God will just, you know, work on that hard heart, right? Because uh, we, we can't do anything with that heart, but God can. Um, Susie says, sadly, yes, but I continue to pray for them. So why would they be shaking the dust off of their feet, friends? 
What does that mean? What is that? Zara says they are not ready. I like that perspective. Yeah, yes. that's a good. Cindy. All right. Gentile dirt versus <laughs> Jewish dirt. Cindy got it. It's basically, Lauren says, saying that they were bad hosts. It's rude. All right. Yep. That's great. That's definitely And what Cindy is referring to is that when the uh, the Jewish people at this time would walk through Gentile territory. when they, they absolutely had to. Yeah, if they had no other options. When they got out, they would kick the dust off their feet like, ugh, gross, none of that Gentile dirt. Well, not only that, they believed that Gentile dirt literally would not mix with Jewish dirt. Kind of a strange it, belief. It would there. never mix in. And so they had to get it all off, <clears throat> like you said, in Gentile territory. So what they're saying, and, and you, you guys are nailing it, is you are no better than Gentiles. You are just as pagan, even though you think you're religious, you're no different. And and it's true that without Jesus, it doesn't matter what religion you are. It true like Satan doesn't care. He doesn't care as long as it's not Jesus. Believe anything you want to. Mm. No problem. Mm. It's, it's a sobering thought. And I say that with the greatest compassion. And I, I hope that that comes across. Yeah. I never say that in a cavalier way. It breaks my heart every time I think about it. Mm -hmm. um, verse 8 says, When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, The kingdom of God is near you. Oh, that's so lovely. When you enter a town, eat with them. Enjoy that. Heal them. You have you know, have power given to you from Jesus. Um, tell, Give them the good news. Tell them the kingdom is near. He's going to switch gears a little bit. We're in verse 10, it says, But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. That's kicking the dust off your feet. I think I got ahead there, sorry. You did, but that's okay. <laughs> sorry Yet be that. sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Mm. I feel like we should take Ooh. verse 12 and, and kind of like, Work that into in. what's coming because woe to is... the Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. Mm. Oof. Okay. What so, does this mean? well, this is. This is this is hard stuff. It's hard to hear, it's hard to talk about, but it's true, so we have to go through it. And this is the value of going through the word of God verse by verse, because it makes you talk about stuff you wouldn't you just wouldn't choose to talk about otherwise. All right, so okay. So <laughs> let's talk about what these towns were, I guess, first. Yeah, that's great. Um first of all, I, I looked at okay, Sodom is first, so we'll take Sodom. Anyone here familiar with the story in the Old Testament of Sodom and Gomorrah, which would have been the cities that were so wicked and so evil that God literally sent fire down from heaven and totally incinerated them. Just annihilated them. They were horrible. Okay, so a lot of people do know that <laughs> They were like, we know them. Yes. They're a wreck. I mean, they were, you have to understand, these cities are so horrific that to this day they're referenced in pop culture. Yes, and a lot of people think it's a made-up fable. No, it's yeah, no, real. It, it was real. They it were really, 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 really fact, awful people. We think, although we can't prove it, that the the Dead Sea, which is just salt, um, basically, it's water and salt. It's the saltiest body of water on Earth. Was the location of Sodom and Gomorrah, and that when he incinerated it, it it so wiped it out that it became this huge trough, and it filled up with salt water, and yeah. So that's... Yeah, there are a lot of salt deposits in that area. Yeah, so so the worst, the worst. And he's saying, um, it, it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on the Day of Judgment than it will be for you people. Yeah. Now, now why do you think that is? I mean, that's a, I, I mean, wow. <laughs> that's an intense statement. Why? That's a huge statement. And it certainly feels, I mean, if you've read the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean, we're talking, I mean, some of the most horrible things that you can do to people, these guys were, I mean, just wicked, wicked, mm -hmm. wicked cities. Mm -hmm. And you don't, I mean, they're bad people here, but they're not, you know, raping each other. And that's not what's going on in this book. And yet Jesus says it will be worse 
the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah, or for you guys, than it will be for Sodom and Gomorrah. Why do you think that is? What do you think is different? Why is he so castigating these people? Yes. And the day of judgment, by the way, is still to come. This is, this is at the end of all time, where the great white throne judgment happens and the, the dead are raised. And yes, um, Roberta said she, uh, Lot's wife turned into a pillar of stone in the Old Testament. Um, it was actually a pillar of salt. You were real close. Somebody was asking about that. Yes. yes that was salt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, you, ex you describe those as the evangelical triangle. Yes, right. well, um, here we are. Bob says, because they had seen and heard and still not believed. Yeah. Um, these people have, Deb says, uh, seen the miracles of Jesus and still don't believe. Okay, you're right. You're Spot right. Spot on. They had more revelation, right? Worse yeah. for those who know better. Absolutely. All right, so Chorazin, done. Bethsaida, Capernaum formed this, um, some, some scholars call it the evangelical triangle, and all that means is like e to evangelize. They were... So, 80% of Jesus' time in his ministry was spent in this triangle of these cities. 80%. Do you understand? He wiped out disease in this area. And we know this because it would say the masses, like probably thousands. Of Tens thousands, of thousands. Thousands of people would come. And it says he healed them all. He didn't just pick a few from the crowd. He didn't have his bouncers looking for right, yeah. that would be easy, that he could get a good yeah. rise out of. No, he healed every last one of them. He cast out all the demons. He was raising people from the dead. He fed 5,000 men plus all the women and children on the country. That was all in this area. And they still rejected him. And, and so when it goes on and it says to those three cities, that triangle, woe to you, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which are Gentile cities that Jesus just, just barely was in and out. And he was real brief in that area. The, and they were very pagan, by the way. They would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes, which is a sign in the ancient days of just absolute, complete, remorse and grief Morning. and destruction of the soul like that was how they outwardly did it and Noel when we were talking you brought up something mm -hmm. really good about that statement yeah well Jesus Jesus has full knowledge of all things that could have been or would have been and so when he makes the statement mm -hmm. if Tyre and Sidon had seen what you have seen they would have repented and been in sackcloth and ashes he isn't being hyperbolic here he has divine knowledge to know that this is a true statement. He is making a factual observation. That should freak them out. Yeah. I mean, good heavens. I, again, we talked a little bit about this last night. These are Roman territories, extremely pagan. Yesterday, we talked about how they treated children. In the past, we've talked about how they treated women and slaves. And it's just beyond barbaric. Barrack. I mean, these are the worst of the worst horrible things you can imagine these people did and yes. openly accepted. And worshipped all these different deities horrible. and sacrificed their newborn babies to the, you know, in the fire. I mean, it was, it it's was just awful. absolutely terrible. Yeah. It's just awful. And he's saying, those guys who you so despise and are so judgmental, for good reason, they're horrible. If I had done there what I'd done here, they would have repented long ago and they would have been absolutely broken over their sin. And repented. Yeah. Wow. And you saw it all. You had it all. You heard it all. You guys have no excuse. And you said, get out. Just no excuse. Get out. We're, you're not doing, because you're not doing what we wanted you to do. Never yeah. mind all the healings and the demon possession and taken care of and the sick and, and the, the dead people raised. We wanted a political messiah and you're not doing it. So, and, and, and also they were like, stop telling us we're sinners. When there are guys over there who are doing way worse. That's right. The Gentiles are the sinners. We are children of Abraham is what they thought. And so, you know, I mean, we're not like 100% good, but we might be 50-50. That's good. And as long as 51-49%. No problem. As long as we have a, you know, the scales tip in the favor of good. That's all. Better than those guys. Stop telling us we're bad. Yeah, they didn't like it. Mm. Mm, man. Zara makes a great point, to whom much is given, much is required, which is a quote from the Bible, and it is absolutely true. Yeah, and these cities were given 
everything. everything. They were given full revelation. Yeah. They had everything they needed to know. Yeah. And in, in verse 15, you might have a version that um, says something more along the lines of, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to, your says the depths, my uh, ESV here says Hades or hell. And, uh, and again, he's not speaking of like the city as a whole. We know the 70 people who he sent out. They came out of this. So. Probably did because they would yeah. have been with him for most of this. So yeah. it, it's just, it's a generalization. It's the city as a whole rejected him, not every single person. But basically, if you were in that city and you saw these things going on, you reject. Yeah, it's over for you. Big yep. time. Let's keep going. Yeah, so, so he gets done with all of this really intense and then he sends them out. And verse 17 says... Actually, this, I don't think we did 16, did we? Oh, no, we didn't. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. Skipping ahead. Skipping the exciting parts. 16, he who listens to you, the 72, listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me, but he who rejects me also rejects him who sent me. Hmm. Oof. Okay, so Jesus, as you keep saying, is the most logical person ever to walk the face of the earth. And this is just a very succinct, logical progression. If they listen to you, they've listened to me. Because they are saying the words of Jesus. He right. has given them the message to tell. And if they reject you, they're rejecting me. And I think this is really important for us to hear, even in 2020. Because sometimes you'll be sharing Jesus with somebody. And they... And they reject the message, but they also, in rejecting the message, they reject you. How many of you, you can just hit the thumbs up, the like button. How many of you have actually lost friends over simply the gospel? And not because you were being a jerk about it and, and whacking them over the head with the Bible every chance you got and being an idiot. It was because you lovingly shared. Maybe they even asked you about it and you shared. Yeah, here we go. Lots of thumbs up going up. And you shared, and that was basically the end of your friendship. And maybe they weren't mean to you. They just simply walked out of your life. And I would be hitting that button myself because I, I have faces in my mind right now of people who, who actually approached me and said, I'd like to talk about it. And we did. And it came down to you're a sinner in need of a savior. And they said, no, thanks. And that was the end. And I haven't really ever had an opportunity to talk to them since because they walked out of my life. Um, but anyway, when that happens, and it's not because you're being a jerk, just remember it's not really you that they're rejecting, even though it feels really bad. They're, they've rejected Jesus, and you're just the conduit, that's all. And so you can, you can feel okay about that. You know, take it for take take it for Christ to take a little bit of suffering that was aimed at him. They can't get to him, so they'll reject you instead. You can do that. Yeah. You can take it. Yeah. And therefore, if they reject Jesus, then they've also rejected God the Father. Mm. This is an important note, actually, because we have he's speaking to and of a group of people, the the Jews, who have for generations at the very least, given lip service to being devoted to God, and I think many of them very much were, right? Or at least they tried. They, they were trying. <laughs> it they was wanted to be. So they, they were all wrong. But they were trying so they, hard. They wanted to be, right? Yes. And so I can hear them say, well, yeah, we, we're not cool with him, but, like, God is, we're, like, all about God. Like, yes to God. And Jesus is going, no. Mm. If you reject me, you've rejected God the Father because we are one. Yes. You don't get to not have Jesus, but have God the Father. It doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense, right? And so he's saying, okay, if they reject you, they've rejected me, and therefore they have also rejected God. Mm. And, and that's also an important note for today, is sometimes you'll come up, you know, come across people who say, oh yeah, I believe in God. And you're like, oh, how about Jesus? No, I mean, he was a good prophet, he was a good man, but like, no. And, and that's actually not a, that's not, it's kind of a non sequitur. <laughs> you can't, mm -hmm. they, they are one. Jesus is God himself. That's right. And we talk about this as, as the Trinity, is that God in his extraordinary ability is three distinct persons in one person. And he is one God. And so you've got this really interesting sort of like mind loop there. But that's the incredible nature of who God is, is that he can, 
he, he's beyond our normal rationale and logic. Yes. But if you've rejected Jesus, then you've rejected God. That's you can't right. have one without the other. And I will go another step and say, if you get the wrong Jesus, you also have the wrong God. You, that is a wonderful statement as well. Uh, there are some religions that will teach that brother um, Jesus is like the, the spirit brother of Lucifer, Satan. That God, they were both created beings by God the Father, and, and they were brothers, and it's all this back and forth, and he's going to, oh, what? <laughs> that is so antithetical to Scripture. That is, oh, wow, talk about doctrines of demons. I almost can't talk about it because it feels so heretical to even say the words. You get that, Jesus? You've got the wrong God as well. So yeah, wonderful. Got to get Jesus right to get God right. Yeah, wonderful statement. So now he sent them out. They've gone and done their thing. They come back to him. All 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Oh, oh, that would be so good. Honestly, that would be kind of a cool moment if you come back and you're like, Jesus, we did it. It went really well. And Jesus is like, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And you're like, oh, you did? Really? <laughs> what? <laughs> Should we talk about that? What does that mean? I saw Satan All right. fall from heaven like lightning. Let's back up so we can kind of get a running start here where, where it says Lord, they, they come back with joy. First of all, they all came back. Jesus said, I'm going to send you out like, like lambs among wolves. And, and he protected them even at that. The reason we think many of them were probably martyred later is because he didn't mean just this one time. This is an ongoing thing, and probably many of them ended up giving their lives for him at some point. But they are so happy. They're full of joy because they saw spiritual fruit. While they were out, they, people were coming to know Jesus as their Messiah through their ministry. And they say, um, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Remember when we had that, I think it was number six, Bible study number six was all about demons and Satan and all of that stuff. And we did that really intensive study for that particular one because it keeps coming back up and we don't want to have to keep going over all the information. So if you didn't watch number six, I'm pretty sure it's in Do the it. title. Go to our YouTube page. It's easier to find Bible study hub. Listen to it. But anyway, um, we said that often healing was used to describe an exorcism. So it wasn't just the person being released from the demon, it was actually considered like a physical healing to have that demon removed. And I think that we can say here, he had sent them out to do healing and they come back and they say, wow, even the demons were in included under the umbrella of that authority that you gave to us specifically. By the way, this does not apply to you or me. This was a specific authority given to just those 70 people at for that specific time. particular time for a specific pur purpose. And I just say that so that you don't start to go, wow, I, I am not able to heal people. No, you, you're not. No. <laughs> I can't either. If I could, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be in the hospitals working with COVID. Um, but anyway, when it says to him, um, or when it says to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Some of you are familiar with... Uh, the passage, I, I believe it's in Ezekiel, but now I should have looked that up because I'm not positive I I'm right. I think you're right. Okay. Where it talks about Satan's beginning and how God created him as the most beautiful of all the angels. This would have been right around the time of all the creation, by the way, maybe a little bit before the creation of the heavens and earth. And um, he, was, he was probably the worship leader, honestly, of, and his job was to lead all the hosts of angels in worship to God. And instead of doing what he was supposed to do... He decided he wanted to be God. He said, I will be like the Most High. He wanted to be worshipped. And so at that moment, he sinned, he fell, as far morally he fell, and a third of the angels joined him, and God kicked them all out of heaven, and he is now known to us as Satan, and all of the fallen angels we know as demons. And thank you, Margie says, yes, Ezekiel, thank you. <laughs> Maybe 36, but I'm not positive I'm right on that either. <laughs> oh, good job. Now you can look it up and see. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll run out of luck one of these times and I'll get it wrong. Pull that out. Well done. Oh, I don't know. We'll see. Um, anyhow, so so there is that statement. And that's what I always thought here. Like, oh, he's speaking of when, when Satan fell from heaven. But, but then if you kind of look at the context, you go, that's a really weird thing to say here. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> what is that? Because then it's kind of like, that's kind of like the end of it, you know? So why, why would he say that there? So when I got into it a little deeper, when it says, I saw Satan fall. This is so good. <laughs> you know, the Greek language is way more descriptive. Word so much better than English. Than English. English so is better. so general. Like we have so one good. word for love. They had all these different words to describe different kinds of love. So, so at this point, it says, I guess a better translation would be, I, I saw over and over and over. Like continuously saw. Like saw I saw and I kept seeing Satan falling like lightning from heaven. So what we think he's saying is, Every time the demons were subject to you, every time a person put their trust in Jesus as their Messiah, it was like, like lightning, lightning. like Satan got it again, like slam dunk. You nailed him. You nailed him. You nailed him. It's so victorious. It is so victorious. It was like this, this moment in time where he was defeated over and over and over again. And that should give you such great joy. Thank you. I'm seeing some, some <laughs> yes. lives happening here. That should give you such great joy to know. And by the way, too, you don't, you don't have a city get saved. You don't have right. a, a country that's a Christian nation. It's one person at a time that comes to Jesus Christ. That's it. It happens one person at a time. And every time that person chooses to cry out to Jesus for salvation, for the forgiveness of their sins, when they admit that they're a sinner and that they can't do it on their own, and they say, Jesus, forgive me. It's like that lightning bolt yeah. again, like Satan is defeated again. He's no longer in charge of that person. That person just moved out of his kingdom into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, out of, out of the realm of hell into the realm of heaven and forever, and they are held by God forever and Satan can never ever pull them out of God's hand and cast them into hell which is where he wants them all to go so he is so defeated so I, I see that lightning is just kabam oh gotcha <laughs> Woo! that was it. good yeah Jesus so descriptive yeah he says I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy nothing will harm you again he's talking about a very specific moment in history he's talking about what he said these specific guys out to do at this specific time but you made a great point is that some people have read this verse and been like haha this means i can handle handle really venomous snakes have you seen these people they're nuts <laughs> Don't do this. Don't grab a scorpion, guys. I've never seen them handle scorpions. Interestingly Honestly, isn't enough, that funny? <laughs> the snake might not bite you, but the scorpion, 100%. I lived in Arizona. It I will get you. Uh, yeah. They don't get hold, you. They don't hold back for anything. So, yeah. they Remember don't walk around with our black lights? Like, is there a scorpion yeah. right about to walk? Yeah. Bad times. That's why you go to get a bath and... There's a about. scorpion. Yeah. Mm. Never mm. a fun time. Some of you in Arizona, you will also mm. test it. They're like, yes, there's a scorpion right now underneath my curtain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not a good time. Anyway. Don't do that. That's not what he's saying. And it's clear. I mean, that doesn't even make sense. You know, he was like, yeah, Satan is defeated. Now, why don't you go pick up bugs and snakes? <laughs> that, what? Go that hang out with some snakes for no a while. Serpents. Why don't you? Serpents and scorpions. Satan and demons. I mean, it's always. it's always in scripture. Those are two common metaphors. These people knew what he was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he says, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. It doesn't, it doesn't mean pick up snakes. So all he's saying is, look, every time you get out there, you share the gospel, God does his work, and that person comes to faith in Christ. It's like, kapow! Satan gets it. Oh, he gets nailed again by the blood of Jesus, and, and he cannot hurt you. Now, now we know that Satan does come up against us. Demons do come up yeah. against us. We think of Job and, and some things that happened with Paul, and we go, whoa, 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 but he can hurt us. Not, not um, finally. Not eternally. He can sting us like a scorpion, maybe, but he will never cast you into hell, which is where he wants you to be. He cannot hurt you 
you because God's got you. Yeah. This is such a victory. I'm so happy to finally get to this because yes. it's been getting kind of heavy. We're I didn't know if any of you would show up. <laughs> I was like, man, we're going to kill these people off here. But like you said, Jesus is just honest and it's, it's all honest. But uh, it's it just is. so great, isn't it, to have this assurance. Nothing will hurt you. Big win. And then we'll end with this. Verse 20, he says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And and really the word but is would be better um, translated like, but more rejoice. So, so it's not so like, well, be happy. Don't be happy, yeah. but rejoice in this. He's saying, yeah, I mean, yeah, re rejoice, but but even more rejoice. I mean, even more so that the, the demons are subject to you. You're secure in Christ. Your name is written in the book of life. You are assured heaven eternally. Wow. Can you tell us what the book of life is? Well, I did a little bit of study into the book of life because it's a term I'm very familiar with. And if you've grown up in church world, you're probably very familiar with it too. But if you haven't grown up in church world or if you grew up in a church that just never spoke to this, you might be going... Well, well, it sounds a like life. a good thing. I mean, <laughs> the whole life part is good. But I have no idea what you're talking about. So the Book of Life, also called the Lamb's Book of Life, is in heaven where our names are written, those of us who have come to know Jesus as our Savior. And, and when we stand before God, we are judged on one thing. If your name is in that book, that's it. So how do I get my name in the book? We do it every single night. We, we go to that we're sinners, that we are in desperate need of a Savior, that we, we bring nothing to salvation, we bring nothing to God on our own, that all we can do is cry out to be saved from our sin. That's why Jesus died. Listen, if there were any other way, why would he have suffered so much? Mm -hmm. If there were, in fact, he famous. says this in the garden. We'll talk about this when we get there. He goes, Father, if there is any way, let this cup pass from me. What kind of a God would be like, oh yeah, there's all kinds of ways, <laughs> but I'm going to make you do it anyway. Yeah. No, there was no other way for salvation. That's the only way. And if you want your name in that book, covered by the blood of Jesus, held by God forever and ever, where Satan cannot get at you anymore. <sighs> this, is the, this is your moment. This is your moment. We pray every night, and we invite you to pray along with us. And we invite those of you who have already done this at some point in the past, and you know that you are held by God's hand. Would you, don't, don't leave us yet, would you pray along with us in your mind for those people who are on the cusp, and they just haven't done it yet, but they're thinking about it, and they want to, but they just can't. Pray that they would be able to make this choice tonight. Noelle, would you like to lead us tonight? I would love to. I'm going to just pray a simple prayer. And if you're at that point and you're like, hey, this is it. It's never made sense before. It's making sense now. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to have eternal security. I want to have that peace that you guys were talking about earlier. Then all you need to do, that's something that's already happened in your heart. Just pray externally with us. The words don't matter. In fact, even the act of praying is less important than this is just something that God has already done in your heart, and we're going to just verbally express this. Mm -hmm. So if that's you right now, just bow your head with me. Just say these words along with me. Say them in your own words. Just cry out to Jesus right now. Lord, Lord Jesus, I, I am so grateful for what you did on the cross. Jesus, we're so broken over our sin. Lord, I am so aware of how incredibly I have fallen short of your perfect standard. God, I can never do enough works. I can never be good enough because I've already sinned. Mm -hmm. But Lord, I know that you went to the cross and you died so that my sins could be covered by your blood. You took the punishment that I deserved even while you were perfectly sinless. You took that punishment so that I could spend eternity with you. Yes. And Jesus, I want to accept that free gift of salvation right now. Jesus, I dedicate my whole life to you. I want to be your daughter. I want to know you and love you more every day. I want to serve you. Jesus, I want my name written in that book of life mm -hmm. so that I can spend eternity with you. Jesus, I believe that you are God, and that you saved me from my sins, and that your blood covers me 
so that I am holy and righteous in the eyes of God, and I want to accept that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope some of you have prayed that prayer along with us. And I'm noticing that some of you have been saying, but my version said the name's written in heaven, and I know that you're concerned. The only place that the names are ever written in heaven is in the book of life. So we're taking other passages putting it together. A little bit condensed. A little bit. And and really, I mean, heaven is something that, like we'll, we'll speak to God like, oh, heaven, look down and blah, blah, blah. We, you know, you know what we're talking about. So heaven can kind of be like a general term that covers quite a mm-hmm. bit of things. Mm-hmm. We use it for all kinds of different things. But yeah, that's, that's how we know that. Amen, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us as always. We really look forward to it. We love you all. And we cannot stop complimenting you as a whole as a group I'll tell you what I keep seeing people posting various prayer requests and things on the page and and it's just like this swarm of wonderful loving people hops on it and goes I'm praying for you I'm praying for you keep it up don't give up I you know I'm on your side and I know you don't know each other. <laughs> Some of you do, but so many special. of you don't. It is so incredibly special that you do this. I've been a part of so many groups where people are so mean. and Christian and, groups at that. I'm and like, and guys, sometimes come Christian on. groups too. They can just be super mean. I have been blown away by your love and your kindness and your concern and your prayers for each other. And I know it. that's... That's Jesus, right? That's because yes. we have the connection in Christ and we love each other because we love him. And so I just want to say thank you and keep up the good work. Keep praying for each other. You know, if you have a special prayer request, please feel free to post it because we care about each other here. We are praying for you. So thank you again. We love you. Hope right. you get a good night's rest. We'll be here with you tomorrow, Wednesday, and Always. Thursday. And then we'll be off Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for the Easter weekend. We want you to focus on the resurrection as well as we want to focus yes. on it. And we want to give a little mental break to yes. ourselves. We're burning. All right. No, we're not really. We love no. it. We're fine. All right. Go make good decisions. Be happy people. We love you, team. <laughs> we do. Good night. Good night. <laughs>